Well, I want you to be turning today to, uh, to the book of Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5, and I want you to be looking there at uh, some verses. We have a little bit of a broken story because here in Mark chapter 5, the, the story begins, and then it, there is a break, and then there is the culmination or the resuming of that particular passage there and so we're going to begin in verse number 21 and and go through verse 24 and then we'll pick up again in verse 35 so if you'll stand one more time for the reading of God's word as we honor his word here we find Jesus in the midst of the Gospels, preaching, teaching, healing mission. And there we pick up in verse 21 of Mark chapter 5. Now when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet. And he began, he begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, that she may be healed, and she will live. So Jesus went with him, and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. Now we have the interruption there as another healing takes place, but pick back up in verse 35. As they were continuing on to Jairus' house, verse 35, and while he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house and said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not be afraid, only believe. And he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw a tumult and those who wept and wailed loudly. And when he came in, he said to them, Why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. But when he had put them all outside, he took the father and mother of the child and those who were with him and entered where the child was lying. And then he looked, he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talita kumi, which is translated, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was twelve years of age, and they were overcome with great amazement. But he commanded them strictly that no one should know it, and said that something should be given her to eat. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to worship here today. What a tremendous time we've already had of worship as it's prepared our hearts, looking to you, the great Father of the universe, and our personal Father, those of you who have trusted Jesus as Savior. Lord, we together can worship your name today. I pray now you would honor your word that you've given to us and I pray that you would help us as the Holy Spirit explains it to our hearts even now. Father, do your great work. We'll give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Many years ago, Paul Harvey described what a father was, as only Paul Harvey could. He said a father is a creature that's forced to endure childbirth without an anesthetic. A father growls when he feels good and laughs when scared half to death. A father never feels worthy of the worship in a child's eyes. He never, he's never quite the hero his daughter thinks, never quite the man his son believes him to be, and this worries him sometimes. So he works too hard to try to smooth the rough places in the road for those of his own who will follow him. A father gets very angry when the school grades aren't as good as he thinks they should be. So he scolds his son, though he knows it's the teacher's fault. A father gives his daughter away to another man who is not nearly good enough so that he can have grandchildren who are smarter than anybody's. 
A father makes bets with insurance companies about who will live the longest. And one day he loses, and the bet is paid off to those he leaves behind. That is a father. Well, today we're going to look at a passage of another father, and we're going to see some sterling faith that is exhibited through the life of this one man, this ruler of the synagogue by the name of Jairus. And as we come upon him today, there's a number of things that we could say about his life as he comes in the midst of a very distressing situation. And that basic thing that we find that he comes for this particular reason is this. He knows Jesus is his only hope. And by the way, let's say this for every person here today. Jesus Christ is our only, our one and only hope in this world. He's the only one who's going to make sense out of this. He's the only one that's going to call it the order. He's the only one who can save our soul as he died on the cross for our sins. And he is our one hope today and for all who will trust to him, not only for salvation, but most importantly salvation. If you've never taken that leap of faith and said, yes, Lord, that's what I need to do. I need a Savior. But if you have, then we find that he's our one hope for daily life. He's our one hope for healing and sustenance. He's our one hope in getting through this, this wayward, wicked world at times, to getting through the maze of society and the days and times we live in. And for fathers and grandfathers today and parents alike, it is, he's our one hope to help us to be able to raise children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So as we think about that subject of one hope today and Jairus coming to him at this particular time, he came because he had that one hope. What was it about this one hope that he had? Four things I want us to see very quickly here today. And the first one is this. When we think about Jairus, one of the things that we can point out as attributes and, and characteristics of his life would be this. And that is, first of all, that he possessed an urgency. Now, in verse 21, it tells us about the throng of people that were there and all the things that were taking place. Uh, there had just been a deliverance of a demoniac. There have been other healings that are taking place here in this small town of Capernaum located on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee where we go and we'll go again here in about four months or so. We find here that, uh, that he possessed an urgency because he came to Jesus in the midst of life, in the midst of teaching, in the midst of everybody else around him. Verse 22 says, And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name, and, this, and we think about this, this is pretty astounding that Jairus would come at this particular time and that he would come to speak on, uh, to, to Jesus. Because remember, the religious leaders, the Jewish religious leaders, were, were not exactly fans of Jesus. As a matter of fact, most of them did not even tolerate him, and most of them hated him. But here is a ruler of the synagogue that is coming to, to, to see Jesus at this particular time. I think there are several unwritten reasons here that we know that he came, but most importantly was the urgency of the hour that his daughter was sick. Now, when you are, were a Jewish rabbi, leader in the synagogue, in charge of the services that would go on there on Saturdays, uh, he was one who believed in the law and the prophets. He held up all of those things to the highest degree possible. But he knew everything about this Jesus at the same time. Why? Because Capernaum was a very small town. Perhaps it's been said that no more miracles, that, that the, the miracles that we know of, that, they, that at no other place in all of Israel were more miracles taking place than right here in Capernaum. And so this 
leader of the synagogue, this ruler, he knew exactly who this Jesus was. He knew exactly the miracles that he had done. He knew exactly all the things that were called into order this day. He, he was aware of, of the recent happening that you would read back, uh, another chapter back, and that is about those men that we talked about a few weeks ago that came, and when they could not get into the house where Jesus was, they broke up the roof and let down their paralyzed friend right there in Jesus's presence he knew of that he had heard of that he had heard of the exorcisms and things that had taken place and so this wasn't anything new to him but we find here that he is coming to Jesus because of the urgency of the hour it was a real time of decision this was a defining moment can I say to you today that sometimes God has to bring us to those urgent places in life before we see our great need of Him. Sometimes He has to allow us to see when everything is said and done, we really don't have anything but Jesus. He's the only one who can bring us out of despair, the only one who can save our soul, the only one who can give us eternal life in heaven. It's not by our good works. It's not by anything we can do except to receive his free gift of salvation that he has given to us. But the urgency of the hour brought this man, this ruler, Jairus, there in the very presence of Jesus, and he comes, and, and he, he could have held on to his own traditions. He could have held on to his own pride that said I'm, I'm not going to come to him when everybody else is around but remember the whole place is packed everything is taking place but the urgency was such that he knew he had to get a hold of Jesus at this particular time he had to, to say I can't do it I've got to put aside my own ability it's not in my just coming to church. It's not in my just doing good and, and doing good unto my neighbor. That won't hack it when it comes down to it. I've got to see Jesus and know him personally. And so we find that he came to this particular moment. He didn't have everything that he could explain. He couldn't explain everything that, that Jesus did. He couldn't explain for sure everything about him. But this one thing he knew, if there was hope anywhere, it was found in the person of Jesus Christ. I want you to notice here, though, some things that began to take place there in verses 22 and 23. As it continues there, he comes and he falls at Jesus' feet, and he says, My daughter lies at the point of death. Will you please come? Just lay your hands on her, and she will live. There is a testament of faith right there. He knew what Jesus could do, could do right here. Look at verse 24. So Jesus went with him, and the great multitude followed him. Now, I don't know if you see that too clearly there, but let me remind you of what's taking place. He's in the midst of everything that he's doing, teaching and healing and all that he is bringing forth, and all of a sudden this ruler comes and says, My daughter's at the point of death. Will you come? And so he just leaves the crowd, except the crowd didn't leave him. They're following him, and they're walking along the way as they're heading to Jairus' house. There's some things that, step, that really just jump out of this passage, and this is this. First of all, it is the accessibility of Jesus. He is accessible for every person who will come to him by faith. It's not just for we Baptists. It's not just for good people, not just for, for this person or that person, but it's for every person. He is accessible day or night, 24-7, for us to call upon in faith. But another part of this is he's not only accessible, but he is available. And he comes and he leaves right where he is and comes to the house of Jairus on the, in the drop of a hat here. You see, when it tells us that, that, uh, that we're going to see some great things that God does if we just call upon him, our problem is we don't call upon him. When it comes down to it, we like to do as much as we possibly can ourselves, and when we get in a real pinch, then we'll call upon Jesus. He says, listen, call upon me now. 
Jeremiah, J-E-R 33-3, is a great phone number where God says, call upon me. It's, it's just really a, 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 a call for us. He says, call upon me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. The wording there describes that he's speaking of inaccessible and unfathomable things godly things that you can't know except that you call upon my name. It's the urgency of the hour that brought Jairus to Jesus. It's the urgency of the hour that will bring the woman that we'll see in just a little bit to Jesus. The urgency of the hour that brought blind Bartimaeus to Jesus. And he knew if it was his, his only hope was to be found in Jesus. If I'm going to be healed I've got to cry out, Son of David, have mercy upon me. And so he took advantage of that situation. Zacchaeus knew that Jesus may never pass his way again. He had one chance. He had one opportunity. The woman at the well, there drawing water where no one else would talk to her because of her reputation, but Jesus talked to her. It was her one and only opportunity. Let me say that when Jesus passes by, you need to take advantage of him. Because he's coming your way, and he can do the miracles, he can save your soul, but you have to be willing to come to him in all types of humility. This father exhibited an urgency on behalf of his daughter. Sometimes God needs to bring us to that particular point of urgency to get our attention it seems to scream in our hearts and minds a season of the soul but there's a second thing we find here and that is about Jairus and that is that he exhibited a humility notice in verse 22 that when he came to Jesus he saw him and he fell at his feet an act of humility he fell at his feet he could have came to Jesus saying I'm the religious ruler of this synagogue and I'm here to say, if you're exactly who you claim to be, then I demand you to go to my house because I've got a need right now. No, we don't find that attitude. We find humility. Here's the problem today. Jesus certainly is a friend of sinners, and he's a friend of, indeed. And as, as we find even that, he is, that we can be the friend of God, let's understand that Almighty God is not our best buddy. He is Almighty God. He is holy, he is high and lifted up, more wonderful than we possibly could ever bring, at, could, could ascribe glory and honor to his name. And so we have to come to him in, to hum, in humility. No person will ever be saved by his grace who does not see themselves as a sinner. Seeing ourselves in need and hopeless, utterly hopeless without him we have to fall in our humility and say, I can't, you can. Oh God, I am a sinner. You remember as the, uh, the, the, the great um, Pharisee came into the temple that day and he saw the tax collector who was weeping and could not even look up and, and he was asking for the mercy of God that he just have mercy upon me. And all the religious person could do is say, I thank God I'm not as that person. How many people today say, well, I'm just glad I'm not out there doing this and out there doing that as if we have attained righteousness in our own deeds. It's only by the grace of Jesus. So we have to fall in humility. So he comes, he doesn't just come in a humble form. He doesn't just come with a few humble words. But the Bible says that he falls at the feet of Jesus. Whenever you want to get a hold of him and see him, who he, see him as who he is, high and lifted up, we'll fall upon our knees. Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up. And so he had no problem ascribing to him glory and honor. And he saw himself, for I am a man who is undone. I, I dwell among a people of unclean lips, and my own lips are unclean. And so we find Jairus here falling down before the Lord. Remember, there were two different thieves on the cross, one who had humility about him, one who demanded for Jesus to save himself and the other thieves on the cross. But the one who had humility saying, we've done things to deserve this, 
but not this man. Would you please remember me in humility? And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. In paradise. The crowd around the cross demanded that he came down, would come down, but he did not come down. Jairus comes. He falls at the feet of Jesus, which is clearly out of character for a regular synagogue leader, especially a Jewish leader for this person who claimed to be the Messiah, and others actually claimed it for him that he was the Messiah. And so when we think about him falling at the feet of Jesus, we think about our own need to swallow our pride, to humble ourselves. And if we humble ourselves, he says he will exalt us in due time. We've got to see our hopeless and helpless condition without him and bend the knee to him because he reminds us in Philippians 2, there's coming a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now we can do that to our own salvation that he will grant to us and be with him eternally, or at the great white throne judgment, you could see all your sins and everything, that the times that you rejected Jesus, and to your own condemnation into an everlasting lake of fire, you will say amen to your own condemnation. But you will profess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He exhibited a humility. But there's a third thing we find here, and that is he revealed a priority. It says that he begged him. He didn't ask him, but the strong wording is that he begs him and says, my little daughter is at the point of death. Would you just come lay your hands on her that she can live? Now, if you've ever had a child in the hospital, and when you have a child in the hospital and they're laying there in that bed, and it's, it, you are utterly helpless to do anything for them, you could say a thousand times over, I wish I was in the bed in their place, but you can't. This, this man comes, and all that he can do is put himself at Jesus' feet and say, oh, if you'll just come lay your hands on her, she will live. It, nothing else mattered. And he really didn't care about all the other people that were there at this point. The only pressing matter, priority, was that he see Jesus. His reputation as a synagogue person uh, and a leader of the synagogue really didn't matter at this time. The only thing that mattered was his daughter. Do you know what keep many people away from Jesus? They're worried about what somebody else may think. Worried about what's somebody else going to think of them. You know what? I think of someone who comes to know Christ. I think more of them than I've ever thought of them in my life. Because they have said no to themselves and yes to Jesus. They've made the only decision that's going to be an eternal decision that will go with them throughout eternity in receiving Christ. Jairus, Jairus didn't care what these people were thinking at this particular time. He just knew this. Jesus Christ of Nazareth had the power to heal. That's all that mattered. This man's faith was in Jesus. Now, you say, well, sure, we believe in Jesus. Well, let's understand, this is before the cross. This is before the resurrection. These things had not happened yet. And so he honestly believed Jesus, by faith, was exactly who he claimed to be, and his works proved who he was. Almost really with a faith like an Old Testament faith, that God could see the heart of a person who truly was humble and repentance and had a true faith in God. This type of faith in Jesus was expressed here and was rewarded by him. We're reminded throughout the New Testament, you have not because you ask not. And he says, ask anything of the Father in my name and he will do it for you. James 1 says, let him ask in faith, not doubting. Don't even give it a second thought because my Father will do it for you. The tax collector who cried out, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The man who had a legion of demons is delivered and converted. He wants to go then. This is right before here with Jesus. But Jesus said, no, stay here and give your testimony to others. They need to hear you here at this particular time. 
Remember that Jairus had heard when all of this was taking place, especially the healing of the paralytic, he had heard Jesus profess that he would forgive sins, which is easier to say your sins are forgiven or rise up and walk. And so either way, through the healing or through the forgiving, he was claiming a deity here, and he knew that. And yet he comes by faith the same. Now we have synoptic writers here, gospel writers, that give the story. One says that, that when he came to Jesus that he, his daughter was dead. It says here that his daughter was dying. It means basically she was at the point of death at that time. J.B. Phillips says that Jesus had been to the Capernaum synagogue many times. Remember, he would headquarter there many times. And that he possibly, and he says probably, knew this 12-year-old girl because he had seen her and talked to her before. He knew exactly who the ruler of the synagogue is. And by the way, Jesus knows your name. He knows your DNA. He knows everything about you, including every sin I would ever commit, every sin you would ever commit. And he still went to the cross and died for the sins of the world and my sins. You see, that's the type of Savior that we have. Jesus right away takes time for this man and says, I'll go to your house. And they were on their way when they are met with this horrible news. Jesus stopped everything else that he was doing. Why? Because this was the priority. His teaching he would resume at another point. There were other miracles along the way that would have to be, that would happen. We know that from the scripture that we read here. But understand that Jesus always responds to the cry of help. The true cry of help he will always respond to whether it was sickness or whether it was death or whatever. But Jairus was broken, and he's come to Jesus, and this is the only priority in life that really mattered. Can I say this is a great place to interject this? The greatest thing that we can ever do for our children is to make sure they know Jesus personally, to make sure they know Jesus in a very personal way. As fathers and mothers, we've had the responsibility to raise our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And we want to make sure that they're well-rounded. Yes, they'll play sports. Yes, they may be in ballet. They may be in drama and all types of clubs and everything. Going, But listen, the only thing that's ultimately going to matter is their spiritual connection with Jesus. The only thing. So so why would we give all these other things as if they're of equal importance or even if they excel beyond where Jesus is in life when the only thing that's ultimately going to matter and everything else has passed away is going to be Jesus? Why would we be excessive in that particular area? We like to hang on to the Scripture. Well, you know, the Bible says raise your children up in the way they should go, and when they're old, they will not depart from it. Let me just explain that a little bit more. Yes, that is a true Scripture. And there are no caveats there, but there's a whole lot in that word train. That is not to expose them and let them make their own decisions. That is not to say, well, you know, I've exposed them to a little bit, but I like them to be well-rounded so they're exposed to all these particular things in life. And and so I just want to expose them. I I want to expose them to all the different drugs and expose them to all the alcohol so they're well-rounded. They see the commercials on TV and everything seems to be legal in this day and time. And, and, and let me say, I want them to be exposed to all these things. The only thing that's going to matter is whether or not we know the Lord Jesus Christ personally. Why would we not want to live for Him here? So everything else comes behind that in life. That is the training that we put into them now so that they will hold on to it even as life continues to go further and further. You see, too many times we, what we want spiritually for them is a bountiful harvest without any work of training. And that's why too many times we suffer from crop failure because we haven't taken the time to plant the seeds. Can I tell you on this Father's Day, one of those most important times in my life. 
It was in August in 1975. And we were having an area-wide crusade at the Catawba College Stadium there. A well-known evangelist was coming. And on that Sunday night, we were not having churches. All the different churches were gathering there. My father said to me on that Sunday afternoon as he had been involved in some of the different things, ushering committee or whatever he was doing, he said, what are you doing tonight? I said, well, me and some of the guys thought we'd just go to a movie. And he said, no, you're not. You're going to the crusade. And I said this, and I've said this time and time again in my testimony. God gave me lockjaw. And I could say nothing else except, Okay, yes, sir, I'm going. I went that night rather reluctantly, but I tried to act pretty spiritual about it. And as a 17-year-old facing my senior year later on in that particular week, I sat there, I listened to the charge of the gospel, and at the end I responded to the message. And it was as if I was saved all over again in true surrender and, and repentance and faith again in my Lord. And from that point on, my life has never been the same. It led off into a senior year that led me to be able to share faith with several of my classmates, and several of them come to know Christ as Savior. Still involved in sports and other things going, but I could still attempt to be a witness for my Lord even so in the midst of all the other things that were going on in life. And it was... Then a year later that the Lord called me to preach. But let me say, if it were not for the fact of my daddy saying, this is what you're going to do. You see, he didn't let up. He just said, I started to say gently. He just said rather sternly, this is what you're going to do. And, and I said, yes, sir. But I want to tell you, I, would not, I believe I would not be here today if it were not for my daddy. And my parents took us to church. And at a young age, or at the age of 12 actually, for, or 11, excuse me, for me, I trusted Christ as Savior. But I never really grew in my faith until that particular night when I gave everything back to the Lord. You see, as Jairus came on behalf of his daughter, there was, there was a priority and as parents and grandparents and leaders, we have to make that a priority. And listen, this is not to shift it all upon parents. You may have grown up not in that type of environment. You may be here today, and you're here because you want to be here. You're probably not even made to be here. Let me say this to you. It's still on you. You ultimately will have to stand before him, but you need to make Christ a priority. And Jairus made Christ a priority here. There's one more thing I want us to notice, and that is as we move through this passage, there's an interruption that takes place. In verses 35 through 43, the story has this break. Or actually in verses 35 through 42, there's a break there. And, and it tells us as they were walking along, there's that all of a sudden in the midst of this throng, it says there was a multitude, a throng of people, Somebody touches the hem of his garment. There was a woman there who had an issue of blood. She was hemorrhaging 12 straight years. That, you, some of you ladies here today, who could have had some of that problem, except you don't understand that when you're hemorrhaging, you are deemed unclean, which means you could never go to the temple, you could never go to the synagogue. 12 years. She knew her one and only hope was Jesus. And she's saying, if I can just get through the crowd, then I can just even get close enough to touch him. She had the faith to believe that God could do something in her life because there went Jesus. And so she reaches through the crowd. She pushes through enough that she could reach the edge of his garment. And all of a sudden, as she touched, she was completely made well. And Jesus turns around and says, who touched me? And his disciples are walking with him there, and they say, are you kidding me in this crowd? Everybody's touched you. We have no clue who's touched me, who's touched you. He says, somebody touched me, and, and it was a touch of faith. He wasn't going to scold somebody. 
It was a touch of faith. By the way, he knows every person who comes by faith to him. And he knows your name. And he knew it was a touch of faith. He wanted to reach out to him. And he said, I felt the healing power leave me. And the woman falls down. She says, it was me, sir. I just knew if I got to you that I could be healed of this horrible disease. I've gone to physicians. I've used all of my income for this. And I'm still no better. And I knew my only hope is Jesus. And so she came to him. And he said, yes, and your faith has made you whole. And by the way, he's still our only hope today. You may be in perfectly good health, but he's still your only hope. You can try everything else in the world, and you'll still come back to the only hope you have is Jesus Christ. But then the story picks back up here that as soon as they were through with her and they started walking again, the the family members, some of those by the wording used here, came to Jesus and came to Jairus and said, your daughter is dead. Jairus, don't trouble the master anymore. His services are not needed. And Jesus turns very quickly and says here, listen, Jairus, the faith that brought you this far is not about to leave you. Your daughter is not dead. She is only sleeping. This is not a soul sleep. He's talking about the body. Basically, that he was saying, she may appear to be dead and she is dead, but this is not the end. She is going to wake up is really how we would take what he is saying there. And so, as we find here that they came and they brought this news, and and he goes on to the house. And again, Capernaum's a small area, so it didn't take long to get there to the house. But I happen to think that there had to be a little bit of hopelessness in the eyes of Jairus. And when Jesus saw that hopelessness, he says, hang on. Don't let go of that hope. Don't let go of that faith because I am here. But, but nobody had ever raised the dead at this particular point. Nobody had ever been brought back from the dead like this. And so how could this take place? But Jesus turned to the ruler here of the synagogue, Jairus, and he says, that faith that you had in the beginning, hold on to it. Stop fearing and just keep on believing. Replace your fear with faith. Hold on to that faith. And so he looked him right in the eyes, and I believe the faith of Jairus was was bolstered again because the power of Jesus had not diminished. This would be the same power that would raise his friend Lazarus from the dead we read about in John chapter 11. It's the same power that led Jesus to conquer death, hell, and the grave as he did not stay dead but was raised the third day on that resurrection Sunday. Do not be afraid. Luke says it this way in Luke chapter 8, verse 50, Do not be afraid, only believe she will be made well. So Jesus goes in the house. It says very clearly there that he took the inner circle with him. James, Peter, James, and John, they go in the inner circle, and it says there's wailing and weeping and mourning. And, and, and this is not just an average funeral home scene and receiving of friends, family members. This is a situation that mourning went on. They were wailing, they were weeping, and there were paid mourners. Some of you could say, I kind of like that job. <laughs> paid mourners that, that would go and just, and just do it. Oh, oh, what has happened? Oh, she was so young. She, and this says, and the flute players are playing. Now, here's what they did. This was not like our orchestra. These flute notes were no range. It sounds like a symphony warming up. You ever heard that? There were notes that were displaced everywhere to say, this is the situation here. It's total chaos. Oh, she's died. She's left her. Oh, are we doing good enough? And they're getting paid for this. So Jesus comes in and he says, what is all the commotion about? Now literally he comes in and he's busting up the party. Verse 39, why make all this commotion and weep? The child is not dead but sleeping. Stop your weeping. It's pointless. 
Now, he's not talking to family members here. He's talking to the paid mourners and paid orchestra who's come in at this particular time. Listen, what Jesus is really saying is, death is over because I've just stepped in the situation. When I co- Listen, whenever Jesus shows up, something's about to happen. Whether it's in your life, my life, on the scene of this church, in the scene of this nation, something is about to happen. All things change. And it says in verse 40, when he said, Gee, she's not dead, she's just sleeping, they ridiculed him, they scorned him, they mocked him. This is, this is the wording that's used there. It's the same type of ridicule. They could, <laughs> he's, I mean, they're just laughing and, and trying to make him feel bad. But I love the picture here because of what Jesus did. It says he put them all outside. Don't you just love it? <laughs> Listen, he can, he can clear the temple that, that made into a den of thieves, and he clears the house. Put them out. And only father and mother... And Peter, James, and John were allowed to go in to see the daughter. You see, we live in that world today that's, that would scorn our belief. They think we have to have a crutch called Christianity and that we have to lean upon Christ, but they're doing quite well themselves where they are. And so they can claim to be atheist or just not practicing or saying, well, you know, since I live in America, I guess I would say I'm Christian because I'm not Hindu, Muslim, or a Buddhist. And so I guess I would say I'm a Christian, but I really don't have time for that. The religious nuns or the rising, the biggest population we have in America today who say no affiliation with anything, anybody, and that's the picture of man standing on himself. You're familiar with Pilgrim's Progress. There was an illustrated version that had pictures, and one of those in the story was by the name of Atheist. He's a well-dressed, prosperous old man who is looking back in scorn and, and, and as he looks back, he's got a walking stick in one hand. And as he scorns and mocks those, he's on the edge of a precipice. And where he's about to put the cane down, there is nothing but air. He doesn't realize that in all his scorning and mocking that he is one heartbeat away from death. And then what? That person would come and they would say, well... You know, you may be wrong. All this stuff you believe in may not be, and there may not be anything hereafter. Well, let's just say this. If that happens, guess what? I've lost nothing. But if it happens the way this Bible says, you've lost everything. And because Jesus, who was there from the very beginning, everything that he has ever said, that God ever said was going to happen, going to come true, has, is, and therefore will I'll take the authority of God's Word. But man rests on his own superiority, so Jesus kicks him out. And he goes into the little girl very tenderly. And he takes the hand of the child, verse 41. Talita kumi is what he said. And the words that he spoke there were terms of, of endearment we would say little girl arise but it goes a little further than that the real wording here is this little lamb little lamb will you arise don't you just love Jesus suffer the little children to come unto me for such is the kingdom of God and he knew this little girl, and his heart was broken because their heart was broken. He feels our hurt and our compassion, and, and he feels and he even empathizes with us in every state. And all of a sudden, she rises. Verse 42, the girl arose, walked before she was 12 years of age. He says that again. There's importance there. And they were overcome with great amazement. By the way, Jesus always has time for anybody. His love and mercy reach out to everyone regardless. A woman who is nameless, who had 12 years of hemorrhaging, or a little girl who is 12 years old. He has time for anybody. From the somebodies to the nobodies of life, you can always count on Jesus. And he'll come through. 
And the Bible says there in verse 42 that they were so overcome with amazement. Their little girl was... Now listen, she's not there in Hollywood makeup and just out of it, and they thought she was not breathing. I believe she was in that. She had passed the blue. She was in this ashen color, obviously dead. And they knew she was dead, and that's why they were weeping, mourning, and they were heartbroken. And they knew that she had come back to life. She began to breathe, and she gets up, and it says she's starting to walk about. I know what I would do as a parent. Honey, just sit down for a little bit. She said, I've been down too long now. And she gets up. And Jesus just says on the way out, by the way, give her something to eat. Give her something to eat. And then he says this, don't tell anyone. Why did Jesus always say, don't tell anyone? I'm going to give you a couple of clues here. Number one, because they would have wanted to make him a king and a Messiah who was going to try to rid them from the Roman occupation. Others, if he had revealed himself too soon, they would have sought his life and tried to kill him before his time on the cross. And so Jesus always would say, don't tell anyone what happened here. They'll see it. Here's what I see in my mind's eye. It doesn't record it there. But if you added another verse, I believe it just says, and Jesus slowly made his way through the crowd with his inner circle. And as he left in the distance, without saying a word, the people then realized this little girl is walking. All of a sudden, they look back, and Jesus is gone. How many times has he shown up in your life like that? Just at the time, just when I need him most. Jesus is near to comfort and cheer just when I need him most. It was a priority because Jairus knew that Jesus was their one and only hope. Listen, he's your only hope today. You may be here and there's never come a time in your life where you've trusted Christ, repented of your sins and said, yes, I need him as my Savior. Listen, this is your day. This is your day. The one chance that some of these we talked about had may be your day today that you can come to Christ and say, I want to repent of my sins, trust Christ to be my Savior, my Lord, and I want to follow him from this day forth. Maybe as a believer today, you say, you know, my faith has not been there that strong and I've not been as outspoken, but I I want to be a faithful follower of Jesus. I, I want to be a faithful example to my children, to my grandchildren, to those that are about me, whether I, they, I may just be an acquaintance here in the church or in the community, but I want them to know whose I am and I want them to know why I live like I do. And t- so today this invitation is for you and for each of us. Would you bow your heads? And in this moment, right where you are, there could be some that need to ask Christ to be their Savior. And right now, I'm going to give you an opportunity to make that prayer back to God. And He knows your heart as you do this by faith. Something like this, pray this to God. Dear God, I realize I am a sinner. And I do believe that Jesus died for my sins on the cross so that I would not have to go to hell. Please forgive me. Come into my life and save me. And help me to follow you all the days of my life. Father, I thank you for those who by faith reached out to you like the woman who touched the hem of your garment. They have touched you today. And today they can claim that salvation. Lord, may they walk in that boldness and not be ashamed to tell others. Father, I pray for believers today who need to be that example in this world where everybody's trying to be generic so they don't have to stand out. You're still calling us to be ambassadors for Christ. I'm praying for fathers and grandfathers to be willing to step out, to come, to even humble themselves here at this altar and say, Oh God, I need your help. You're my only hope. And I want to be that example for my family. I want to be that example to my community. I want to be that example to those around. You're our one hope, our only hope. You know, as we look at the man called Jairus, 
we look at a man who didn't care about a whole lot in this world except for the main thing, and that was his daughter. His daughter was at the point of death, and then even after coming to Jesus, he learns that she has died. The only thing that mattered was her healing. The only thing that mattered was what was going to happen to her. You know, we know what the end of the story is and that Jesus said, don't worry, have faith, believe. And sure enough, Jesus brought the little girl back to life. But the great thing about Jairus is the fact that he let nothing stop him in his quest to see Jesus. You see, that's because we only have one hope. One hope, and our hope is only found in Jesus. Nothing else of this world will matter. When it all came down to it, this Jewish rabbi, the synagogue leader, knew exactly what he needed to do, and he found Jesus. Let me ask you a question today as you're watching this broadcast. Do you know Jesus? Have you taken care of the one necessity? Have you trusted Jesus to be your personal Savior? And if not, why not? And if not, why not right now? Because this is a time we can pray and you can ask Christ to come in to change your life and to, to cause you to be who you ought to be. We're going to lead ourselves through a prayer here in just a moment. And as I pray, you pray along with me and you pray these words back to the Father and come into the kingdom and he says that he will receive you. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for every person that is watching today. And our greatest concern would be for those who have never trusted Jesus as Savior. Everything else in the world can be going right, but the one needful necessity is missing. And that is knowing Jesus as Savior. Father, our prayer is that you will touch that heart now, draw them to yourself. And as they reach out into, to you by faith, would you help them to pray a prayer of faith to you much like this? Dear God, I realize that I am a sinner, and I do believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. Please forgive me of my sin and come into my life. Be my Savior, my Lord, from this day forth. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. And Lord, I thank you for those who prayed that prayer of faith. And even today, realize there are others out there. There are parents, there are grandparents, there are great-grandparents, those that want to be uh, the proper fathers and mothers and father and mother figures in lives. And when it comes down to it, the only thing is that we introduce them to Jesus, that they come to know him so that we can spend eternity together with you and celebrate around your throne. And so I pray, Lord, you'd give us that desire, that burden upon our heart that we might lead others to you. Thank you, Lord, that, that our one hope is found in you. And today you said that whosoever shall seek you will find you. Thank you for that promise. I pray you a blessing upon these who watch today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our God is good, and he absolutely will come through every time, just as he did in the life of Jairus. He'll come through in your life and my life as well. With that in mind, my prayer for you is that you go out and have a good and a godly week. We'll see you next time. If you would like to help support ministry at West Asheville Baptist Church, you can do so by visiting our website, westashevillebaptist.org, to give online, or by calling the church office at 828-253-9824.